We're exactly 30 days away from the NFL Draft, and things are heating up. This week, Chuck and I cover the latest news, break down the 2024 offensive line class, and analyze the latest mock draft from Daniel Jeremiah. Let's light him up. I'm Jackson Bevins. And I'm Chuck Powell. And this is Whitewater Drafting. Welcome back to Whitewater Drafting. I am Jackson Bevins, and I am joined once again by my friend and fellow draft sicko, Chuck Powell of KJR. Chuck, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. By the way, I've heard a lot of good things. People really like the name, the Whitewater Drafting. Yeah. Have you gotten that as well? That was all you. Yes. Yes. People, they were yeah. into it because I know you and I were brainstorming. We had a couple of other, yeah. <laughs> couple other ideas, but I think the three of us all thought that was the best one. I'm glad you came through with it. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe we should wear life jackets uh, on the show. Maybe that would be an added <laughs> touch uh, visually for the audience. I mean, I did take some time today to actually shave and shower. Uh, yeah, before you look I great. Look like, uh, yeah, I look like Nick Nolte on a bender uh, about uh, 15 <laughs> minutes ago. So uh, we clean things up uh, for the visual for the visual stimulation that we provide here on That's Whitewater right. Drafting. I just need the life preserver, the orange life preserver, and maybe some trail mix. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Well, listen, there, there's a lot that I'm excited to talk about on the show. And before we get into it, I just want to remind everyone listening that Whitewater Drafting is proud to be sponsored by Seattle Cigar Concierge and Belveni Single Malt scotch whiskey two of my very favorite companies out there all right chuck we had a little bit of news here in the last couple of days and normally rules aren't the most exciting thing but there's been a lot of talk about a couple of approved rule changes to start we've got a ban on the swivel hip drop tackle which i think important for the conversation is different than the hip drop tackle what were your thoughts when you found out that the uh, league was going to start legislating that out of the game? Well, here were my thoughts. I'm like, we got to do a draft show, and now I got to tear up all of my research because I don't <laughs> know if Jared Verse does a hip drop tackle or not, right. and if he does the swivel version of it or if he does right. the legal version of it. So it's like we have to start all over uh, with the entire sport. Um, I, I, I kid, of course. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean – You've seen enough evidence of it that it does look like something that has to be eliminated, especially when they chop up one of those videos and they put tackle after tackle. It it just looks like something that you wouldn't want your child to have done to them in the backyard playing football. So it's something that, yeah, if you can isolate that and you can convince players that this is something we won't miss – The only thing I don't understand about it, uh, Jackson, because you and I don't tackle other large athletic human beings for a living, is just how natural a move that is for them. If there is that ability, if there is time on a play to make that split-second decision as to whether or not I have to tackle him this way or not. I mean, is it a strategy? Is it a strategic maneuver uh, that they can actually go into a play with? That's what I don't know. So this is where, you know, um, you really do have to lean on the football players to tell you how fair or unfair this is. And for the Players Association, because there are a lot of offensive players are going to benefit from this, but the Players Association comes out strong against this uh, ruling, kind of shows you that they have sympathy for the defensive players in this league you are really making it hard to play defense in the national football league how much harder they made it i can't tell you um but uh i am sympathetic uh, to the plight of the defensive player in the modern game yeah you know i i thought, found it interesting that the players association pushed back so hard on it too this was a unanimous decision from yeah. uh, from the nfl owners I think that the player pushback has less to do with saying, oh, you know what? We got to give defense a chance. I think it's, I don't want them to fine us anymore. Last year, the NFL set an all-time record for player fines, and it was like 7X the fines that the league gave out to players for in-game violations of even two or three years ago. And, And I think that, you know, you're not allowed to make any kind of head contact anymore. You're not allowed to go low. Even 
They're not flagging this play, but ball carriers are being fined $41,000 for lowering their head into contact. I mean, to me, this is the Players Association saying, stop taking the money out of our pockets. This is just another way you're going to do it. To me, I think the fatigue from a lot of fans, a lot of fans are upset. Oh, they're turning this into flag football. You know, you can't tackle anymore. Honestly, I, I hear that and I feel that. But this is not the rule to push back against. I think it's just because it's the latest one. This is a dangerous tackle. The yeah. The study on it showed that it has a preposterously high injury rate. It's like 25 times the injury rate of a normal, quote unquote, legal tackle. And it is important to remember that this is the swivel action is, is what this is. You can't grab the player, and then swing around him and land on his legs. You're still allowed to make diving tackles. I know the DK right. Metcalf chase down tackle of Buda Baker has been going around saying, oh, this is a penalty now. No, it's not. Diving tackles are still allowed. But if we want to give defensive players more of a chance, we got to take away the like ticky-tack hands to the face penalties. You got to give uh, defensive linemen a little bit more leeway when it comes to the whole landing on the quarterback stuff. These, these are the things that we got to loosen up. But to me, this tackle is much more akin to the horse collar. And I don't think there's very many people, you know, horse collar was only eliminated a few years ago. I don't think there's a lot of people who are pining for the days of the horse collar tackle. Yeah, I, I think it's very similar to it. Um, and just, uh, just from a lower perspective, it is, you know, it's dropping your hips. It's dropping all of your weight, uh, leaving your feet to create the leverage that you need to bring somebody down regardless of the position that they're in. And we've seen way too many awkward landings. I mean, uh, that stat, uh, you, that stat, that, that tackle creates the league leading cringe stat, uh, mm -hmm. among uh, football fans. It, mm -hmm. it feels like to me, but I'm with you on the other stuff. And I'm hoping that a couple of the other rule changes and we've, uh, maybe I don't yet understand them to the letter of the new law and maybe i won't quite grasp it until we actually see games with the new rules in place because there are a lot of them um, but another one of the rules is uh they're going to start reviewing uh grounding and roughing the passer and i hope this is for the defense and not for the quarterback. Yeah. I'm not sure you <laughs> yeah, can man, I'm, I'm not sure you can protect the quarterback any more than what you are. And I'm all for protecting the quarterback. Yes. Don't get yes. me wrong. Same. But there's way too many times where you'll see like a defensive player have to slow up because they got their hands yeah. on the quarterback and they're waiting for the whistle rather than finishing the play. And sometimes the quarterback yes. isn't ready to go down. And so I like the idea that we'll now be able to review because that's a really heavy penalty, uh, 15 yards or a loss of down or or it's an automatic first down and 15 yards uh, for just playing football. So I'm hoping that that's a rule that's a little counter to this uh, hip swivel so tackle in that, in that, that maybe defensive players are going to stand a little better chance around the quarterback than what they've had the last few years. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. And, you know, the study that they did on this tackle, they went back and looked at all the plays from last year. They found that an illegal version of the swivel hip drop tackle happens about once every 140 plays, roughly once a game. So this isn't something where we're going to see it happening all of the time. And I think they did mm -hmm. a pretty good job of defining what makes it an illegal tackle that, yes, there will be a play or two most weeks where people are upset about it. That's true of any penalty, I think, but I'm with you. I want, I want to see them lighten the load on the defensive players for some of these other calls, but horse collar and hip drop tackles, man, uh, or at least the swivel hip drop tackle where you're twisting and landing on the guy. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with legislating that out of the game on the flip side. Kickoffs are back. You know, yeah. kickoffs have always been one of the most exciting plays in football, and we've slowly watched it get legislated out of the game. And something that I've been banging the drum for for the last couple of years is the XFL-style kickoff, which is back. And for those yeah. who are unfamiliar, or I should say not back, it's, it's making its debut in the NFL this year. But uh, for folks who aren't familiar, the kicker's still going to kick off from his own 35-yard line, except for now... His 10 teammates are going to line up on the other team's 40-yard line, 
and the receiving team's blockers will line up on their own 35. So they're only five yards apart. They're, they're kind of mm-hmm. lined up like, uh, like Revolutionary War armies. And then <laughs> they can't start running until the receiver has caught the ball. And if you've watched any of these XFL highlights, you get everything that you love about the kickoff without all the boring touchbacks and, and BS that has basically eliminated it from the game. I'm excited about it. Yeah, and the dangerous uh, plays because the idea of the long collision. It's the That's right. guy. They're trying to eliminate the guy running 60 yards in a sprint and hitting a guy who's just starting to ramp up uh, his speed. And it has been clocked as the most dangerous play in the National That's Football right. League. So they've wanted to get rid of it. And the National Football League wants to protect the foot and football a little bit uh, and, and try to bring this exciting play uh, back to the league. But I do wonder... Exactly what fan is it that you think is going to like the new kickoff rule? Because I think of the old school fan, this probably isn't going to satisfy them. The one that misses the collisions. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then the new school fan, let's face it, is a fantasy football fan. And there's nothing more frustrating in fantasy football than when you have an offensive player on a team and they don't get a possession because there was a kick return for a touchdown. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I don't, I don't know if, I don't, I don't know if the, if the modern football fantasy football player wants to see the kickoff back in the game. Uh, but I think the, the league does. And certainly it's a play that has often registered as one of the most more exciting in the entire sport. And I, th- I know we're going to get more action Jackson I'm wondering how much more I mean you know because it's so foreign to us I mean is Cordero Patterson uh, they say Cordero Patterson has held out just for this rule to get implemented so that his value goes up yeah do you see that his his guy Arthur Smith just brought him in he just he just joined the Steelers it's like the day after they institute this it's like bang that's one of the more <laughs> valuable players right now and uh, and they brought him in I mean D Eskridge is going to be relevant in Seattle now that, that would be a change <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't watch enough XFL or USFL to know like how much the their kickoff impacted games, but it looks like it should significantly. It looks like we should get so. a lot more returns. Is Cordero Patterson going to return nine kicks for a touchdown this year? I, I mean, is it overcompensating? Um, we're going we're to find out. Is, yeah, I mean, just there are a lot of rule changes. I'm going to tell everybody listening and, and watching right now that if you want something done at your house, let's say you've gotten a little lazy with the garden or maybe you've been trying to, you know, revamp that pool deck, invite the NFL owners over to your house, <laughs> feed them, uh, give them drinks and put them in a room together because they make decisions, man. This is this has been a very productive owners meeting down there in Orlando. Yeah, it sure seems like it, man. And a, you know, I I honestly am in favor of, of both of these rule changes. There's there's one other one we don't need to spend any time on, but just to make mention of it, if it used to be you have to get both of your challenges right to earn a third. Now, if you only get one of your first two challenges right, you get a third. I think that's a good rule too. So I think the owners did something right this year. However, this is a draft show. And you know, yeah. last week we talked about the QBs at the top of the show and we ranked our top five in the draft and that generated a lot of reaction. Since then, the odds of who will be drafted where behind Caleb Williams have shifted a lot. Chuck, we know what order you'd take them in. What order do you think they'll go in? Oh, I think that they're going to go one. Uh, Yeah, this this has been a change here in the last uh, week for me. I think it will be Williams one to Chicago. I think McCarthy's going to go two to Washington. That is insane to me. That is just madness. Uh, I think New England's going to take. Uh, I- I'll say I'll go ahead and say it's going to be Jaden Daniels, but I'm not convinced of that. Um, and I do believe there will be a trade up from Minnesota. I don't know if that will be to four or to five, and that will be for Drake May. Uh, and then I think the Raiders and the Broncos are both taking quarterbacks. Um, so I think there's going to be six in the first twelve. People think I'm crazy for that. Six no, maybe I, in the first 13 because the Raiders are at 13. But the, I'm wondering if the Raiders are going to trade up. So I, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i go ahead and uh, I'll say May 5 to the Vikings. I'll say Knicks 12 to the Broncos and Penix 13 to the Raiders. That's how man. I think they're going to go. Well, I, I tell you what, just just a, as a little teaser for later in the show, we're going to go through Daniel Jeremiah's latest mock draft. And, and 
he is one of the best mock drafters out there because of how dialed in he is to the actual teams and the agents. But uh, yeah, man, what you're talking about is starting to sound more and more realistic. If Drake May is the fourth quarterback off the board, because <laughs> I think he's the second best quarterback in this draft, uh, I think it will just be a race. We're going to be seeing number one overall pick type compensation being thrown out by these teams to move up to get Drake May at four or five. And, you know, honestly, like we've seen the odds change a lot since the last time you and I chatted in terms of who's going to go number two. And the biggest charger is the guy that you pegged. It's JJ McCarthy. And to me, like, he, I think, he, I think he'll be fine. I think if he goes to a team like Minnesota and he's got Kevin O'Connell, who is a bona fide quarterback whisperer who wants to throw the ball all the time, has three great receiving options in Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson. Uh, we could see JJ McCarthy <laughs> Be a super successful NFL quarterback. But he strikes me as someone who has to go to a situation like that in order to thrive, where I feel like Caleb Williams and Drake May and maybe Jaden Daniels have the natural ability to elevate their situation. Well, he is definitely the name right now. Um, I thought Michael Penix Jr. would be the most talked about name in this process, and maybe that will still happen before all is said and done. He's, but it's definitely he's gaining McCarthy steam, right man. Yeah. But McCarthy is definitely the most talked about guy this week. And, you know, this is this is the fun of it all. I, 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 I gave the description to the Whitewater drafting folks that may not listen to my radio show. We do the draftmas celebration for an entire month. We, we get ready for the NFL draft. I kind of liken it to Christmas where it's a month long. Let's face That's it, a right. month long event uh, and not just something that happens on December 25th. Uh, same with this, not something that's just going to happen on April 25th, 26th. 6th and 27th. This is a month long countdown and, and so we'll be analyzing it on, on KJR in the mornings uh, quite thoroughly. So we call it Draftmas. Well, Christmas kind of, you know, Santa had to deal with snow and fog uh, during Draftmas season. You know, we deal with uh, rumors, innuendo, uh, speculation, and smoke. We like to call it smoke. smoke. And trying, yeah, trying to figure out because general managers, coaches, everybody, agents, they'll send out information and it does not have to be accurate and the fun for us on the other side um, is to try to – we don't even have to determine – we don't even have to be right about it. We just get to speculate for fun whether or not we think that these uh, this smoke, if, if it's smoke or if it's actual reality. But I've never seen so much smoke blown than what we saw this week. I mean, Jackson, when's the last time you saw a couple of head coaches – uh, from the same division. I mean, Jim Harbaugh, and I get this, this is his guy, Yeah. but basically saying he's the best quarterback I've ever seen. Right. You know, he's, you know, he, he just put on the best <laughs> yeah. show that we've ever seen before. I mean, yeah. he's got the fifth pick in the draft. I mean, he's obviously not going to take a quarterback, but uh, I don't know how much of that is. I just want JJ to get as high as possible. Cause I like him. Uh, or how much of that is come up to the fifth pick. That's it. And, and no, you and nailed it right there from me. You nailed it right because there. Because nobody's got an inside track on this guy like I do, and I'm telling you, he's the best. He's the best ever. Um, and then Antonio Pierce in the same in, in the same uh, the same you know uh, uh, meeting place is like I don't know how that guy doesn't go number three. I mean, this is a team that is screaming for a quarterback yeah. at 13. And if they want one of these guys, if they want a J.J. McCarthy, they're going to have to move up in the draft. And Antonio Pierce is apparently telling the world that, man, I'd love to have that guy. You know, I hope we can trade up to get him. But I don't know if, if he made a mistake. First-year head coach doesn't know how to play the game or if he just blew as much smoke as he possibly could to try to convince other teams to take McCarthy so that the guy they really want falls to them. You tell me. I mean, to be honest with you, I think it's the second thing on both. I think this is Jim Harbaugh understanding that he has historically unique leverage in this situation because not only does he have a top five pick he has a top five pick and doesn't need a quarterback not only does he have a top five pick and not need a quarterback he coached the player in question for his whole college career so he's not going to take jj mccarthy it is nothing but in his own best interests to have other teams knowing that mccarthy might be available at number five throw the world at him in his return to the NFL 
and and get him extra first round picks as he rebuilds the Los Angeles Chargers in his own image. Now, as far as Antonio Pierce goes, I don't know. Yeah, it could be that he's, you know, a new head coach and this is his first offseason as a head coach and he's kind of figuring it out, doesn't really know how the game is played. I think he is also understanding his leverage, though. Uh, I don't think he's a dummy. I don't think he's naive. I think that he knows, the world knows, that he needs a quarterback. And my guess is J.J. McCarthy is not his guy. And so he is putting maximum value on a potential opponent, maybe Denver, inside their own division, giving up the world Again, for another quarterback, just like they did a few years ago with Seattle, to go get somebody that he's not actually interested in. So, yeah, to me, I, Chuck, I think you nailed it with the second option on yeah. on both guys. I I think there are teams that are in love with JJ McCarthy, but I don't think this is a league wide sentiment. And, and it's the and, but it's the fun of it, isn't it? I mean, that's the just the speculation that leads into it. I mean, uh, Minnesota, you know, they they are into that back into that first round for a reason. They are moving up big time. Uh, they're going to try to get one of these top quarterbacks uh, here in the draft, um, and so the question is, I mean, five makes a lot of sense. I mean, the Chargers just lost. Keenan Allen. They just lost Mike Williams. They already had a horrible offensive line situation. I mean, I'm just it's it's actually sad to watch Herbert play sometimes. He Man. gets beat around yes. uh, so much. So they seem like a very logical team that could drop to 11 and 23 and pick up a little more draft capital and come away with a receiver and a offensive lineman, a, particularly a tackle, uh, in the first round. Um, but then you've got Arizona sitting there at number four, and they've done They're a the linchpin job. team, man. They are the linchpin team in this draft. They have done a tremendous job in, in, in our division direct you know acquiring draft capital here the last couple of years mm -hmm. they've been one of the best at it and yet there does reach a point right where you're like we need pieces we now okay we've gotten the capital but now we need to identify the pieces some star players we're in a position to get one of those pieces do we possibly move down and pass on a chance to get marvin harrison just to acquire more draft capital it, it might be time for them to just stick their foot in the ground and just take some player, uh, some difference makers well, since they are in that fourth spot. Listen, you mentioned this, this is a huge part of the quarterback con or conversation that I think has been left out of the main discourse. How many quarterbacks are you taking ahead of Marvin Harrison? Yeah, well, I'd, I, I, I go three only because – there are three quarterback needy teams, and I think it's a good year for quarterbacks in the draft. Um, a couple of guys that I think are going to be able to hit the ground running uh, in the National Football League, but um, there are also some excellent receivers. I mean, I mean, everything I'm hearing is that Malik Neighbors might be better than Harrison, and Roma Dunze is not too far off that list either. I mean, we might have a situation it. here where it. the first seven picks in the draft are quarterbacks and wide receivers. Well, let me ask you this. If you're if you're the Patriots, would you rather have cuz and and I'll say this for context. Last year the Cardinals traded out of what was it? The number 2 or number 3 pick and then traded right back up to number 6. If you're the Patriots, would you rather have Marvin Harrison or trade back and have Roma Dunze plus whatever you would have gotten? Or or would you rather have a a, a or would you rather have the quarterback at number three versus, you know, say uh, Michael Penix and Arun Madunze or something of that nature? Like, is Marvin Harrison that good or is the quarterback three that good that you're saying, I don't care what I get for him. I'm not moving out of this spot. I think the quarterback position is just too important. Um, we talked about this on the last week's episode. I thought the Seahawks moved last year, and I love Weatherspoon, and I think Jackson Smith and Jigba uh, had a few rough times in his rookie year, but I still have a, have an outlook of a bright future for him. Me too. Um, but last year was their year to move up and get C.J. Stroud, and they, they did not get that done. And that's not hindsight. That was said leading up to our – draft day on our morning show that's right um so i i would say uh that when you're in a position top three and you got a chance to get a franchise quarterback and you absolutely lack one 
it doesn't really matter how good the wide receiver is. And I think Harrison is Randy Moss with a good attitude. So <laughs> yeah. I really love the player. Yeah. Um, but you have to take the quarterback at number three. And you can't play games either to move down. Well, maybe if we move down, we can get a, the, sure. a, a different quarterback and something. No, just identify who you think – can be the franchise quarterback, take him at number three, and let everybody else sort out the wide receivers behind you. No, that's – I mean, I, I, I think that's – there's really sound wisdom in that. You know, for me, there's only two players that I would take ahead of Marvin Harrison in this draft, um, and that's Caleb hmm. Williams and Drake May. And if those are the first two that are gone – Honestly, I'm considering bringing that Harrison. guy in because he's he's going to make life a whole lot easier for for the next quarterback whenever you get him. And I, I think that whatever you get in that hall, whether it be from Minnesota or Denver or Oakland, you're going to have the ability to take a quarterback at that spot. But look, I mean, we could talk about quarterback all day, yeah. every day. But, you know, one of the things that we're doing with this show is picking a positional group from the draft to really dive into. And last week we dug into the running back class. Today we're going to talk about the big fellows up front. And this is a deep class of offensive linemen, especially the tackle position. Everyone is saying that this is the deepest O-line draft in years, but some people very connected to the league are saying that this is the deepest O-line class in decades. A lot of mock drafts have seven, even eight offensive linemen going in the first round. Now, if you're a Seahawks fan, this is a great year to be stuck in the middle. Usually the middle of the first round is a tough place to be because a lot of years, most teams, they might not have 16 first round grades on guys. But when you're a team that needs offensive line, you're going to see some real talent push down to the middle of this round. John Schneider likes to sell us that he's always trying to draft just the best player available, the best player on their board. But this team does have needs, and uh, linebacker one of them. And then I, 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 they need a starting offensive lineman. And I don't think that they mind for a second, Jackson, that that's a tackle that they could move to guard. Uh, your guy that you brought up last week that Husky fans know so well um, seems like a, a real strong candidate at 16 that you know you could start him at guard for his career, Fatanu, and then – um, depending on what happened with Abe Lucas, uh, who we're expecting to see back uh, this year. we got good news on that front from John Schneider this week. Uh, or even play left tackle for you in the future, even though uh, they're certainly invested in cross uh, there. But, um, uh, yeah, it shapes up well that if they did want to identify an offensive lineman or a defensive player, they, they could have a, a pretty good choice pick there at number 16. Well, yeah, and, you know, we tend to as fans i think look at well what does the team need and that's who they should target but you know there's opportunity cost to every decision that you make and and very few places is that more true than in the nfl when it comes to roster building and so yeah okay you let's let's say they feel good about a blue's knee although mike mcdonald's most recent comments were not the most encouraging on that uh basically just you know they were all black box comments i we're not really sure but when you have that kind of flexibility the thing is a lot of guards in the nfl were tackles in college right because if you're the best offensive lineman on your team that's where they're going to put you in college but you get to the point it's like <laughs> okay but just to give an example right i was i was a decent baseball player and in, in high school i was a pitcher you're gonna face two three guys in a good team's lineup that are like all right i really gotta like pitch around this guy i got to college and the nine hitter that i was facing on every team was the cleanup hitter <laughs> in high school right and so like yeah. you you magnify that a thousand times to you know, a lot of guards and centers were tackles in college because they were the best offensive linemen. So I don't, even if you feel good about your two tackles and they signed George Fant free agency, you can still draft a tackle that you feel has the ability to give you that flexibility, not only in moving them around the offensive line, but also gives you contractual flexibility where you don't feel like, okay, you know, Charles Cross is about to be up for a new contract. Abe Lucas is about to be up for a new contract. Maybe one of them is threatening a holdout. Now you've got potentially your next tackle anyway, that gives you leverage there uh, on top of the positional flexibility. But 
you know, we can talk in generalities about how deep this class is, but let's let's put some names to this class because, like I said, I mean, most mock drafts have at least seven offensive linemen going in the first round, and I've identified 10 that have made regular appearances in mock drafts in the first round. You have Joe Alt out of Notre Dame. You have Olu mm-hmm. Fashanu from Penn State, JC Latham from Alabama, Talise Fuaga from Oregon State, Troy Fatanu, who we've talked about a little bit, Amarius Mims, who I love out of Georgia, just absolute gigantor, 6'8", 340, moves like crazy. Yeah. You got Graham Barton from Duke, Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma. Those are all tackles. And then you may very well see a center in the first round, Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon. And so like, there is a lot to choose from. I guarantee you that at least five of these guys are going to be available to Seattle at 16. Graham Barton is a name to keep your eye on as well. I mentioned him last week when we were discussing our predictions, uh, early predictions for what the Seahawks might do at 16 overall. Um, He can play guard. He can play center. He is out of Duke. uh, And he is uh, somebody that um, uh, I've now seen recently, just as recently as yesterday, where people are starting to project him to go to the Seahawks at 16. So it seems a little rich to take a center. Uh, at that point, but um, he does seem like the type of guy that might be a plug and play with upside going forward as well. Well, and if you're a Seahawks fan that is rooting for a trade back, this is the class, right? Because Mm -hmm. you're going to see, because we're seeing so much emphasis put on the quarterback position, right? You talked about five, maybe six guys going in the top 12 or 13 picks right there, which has never happened before. And then you're, you've got, you know, a top end wide receiver draft class that rivals any in history, in terms of you know the top few guys coming out at that position. Of course, you're going to have these tackles going and some defensive yeah. players. You're going to see guys who would normally go in the top ten of the draft be available at 16. And so, if you're John Schneider and there's three or four guys that are on your board at 16. This is the perfect situation to try and trade back. Now the caveat to that is yeah. Trading back is great in theory. You have to find someone who is valuing somebody at your, everybody else is looking at it too. If you got four guys that you think are great still on your board at 16, so do the teams that are behind you most likely. But if you can work a trade back, this feels like the year to do that without actually sacrificing first round talent. Because a lot of times when you trade back in the first round, we've seen this from the Seahawks in the past, you trade back in the first round, you get an extra pick or two on day two or day three, but you might be costing yourself an actual first round talent. I think there's going to be a real opportunity to do that this year if they can find a partner and still get first round talent when they make their first selection. Well, that seems to be the rub, at least at this stage in the process for the Seahawks. So you could stay at 16 and there's a chance because of all this offensive talent and this, you know, this gold rush to get offensive edge, you know, a tackle, a receiver, a quarterback that's taking place in the National Football League. Um, You might have the opportunity to pick maybe your edge rusher of choice at 16 or maybe your interior defensive lineman of choice uh, at number 16. Um, Or you can trade out of that pick, maybe pick up a couple second rounders, high second rounders, and now you might be able to get your center of choice uh, or guard of choice or your favorite linebacker, interior linebacker on the board. So it's kind of what uh, I brought up uh, last week. Um, so you can either go for that, you know, one of those marquee positions that uh, are so valuable right now in the National Football League, which happen to be either uh, creating a better pass game or preventing teams from throwing on you. That's what's r- really valuable right now in the National Football League uh, versus – man, just a couple of really sound pieces that might be plug-and-play starters from day number one, you could see them going either way. Yeah, man. I mean, for uh, a general manager that values flexibility the way that John Schneider's track record indicates that he values flexibility, this is the draft. (laughs) Because typically, if you're at 16, you are in no man's land, right? You are having to give a bona fide big-time first-round contract to somebody that you may not feel is first round talent like i said earlier 
A lot of drafts, when you hear, you know, the scuttlebutt coming out from owners, GMs, they've got maybe a dozen guys with true first round grades. And this year, I think that we've got 20 plus players with true first round grades on a lot of NFL boards. This is a, a, a really special class. You know, uh, I think that we we can speak in the abstract a lot, but it's really helpful to actually have something to anchor to when we talk yeah. about who's going to take whom where. And I mentioned it earlier in the show, one of my favorite people this time of year, and this is not a unique take, he's excellent, is Daniel Jeremiah uh, with the NFL Network. And he had his mock draft 3.0 come out last week and i thought it was fascinating because nor here here's the thing with daniel jeremiah a lot of mock drafts are here's who i would pick if i was this team and these are the players available the way that daniel jeremiah approaches his mock drafts is here's what i'm hearing here's what i think the teams will do and he's connected enough that you can really put some stock into it and as a result he refuses historically to incorporate any trades in his mock drafts until he gets to 4.0. This year, however, he broke that trend. He has a bevy of trades in his latest mock draft, and I want to go through it with you. And Mike, if you could help us out here, why don't you read us through the first round of Daniel Jeremiah's most recent mock draft, including the trades, and then Chuck and I, you know, we'll talk about the things that really stand out to us. First pick, I think it's Chuck, Caleb Williams, the Bears. Second overall, the Washington Commanders, Drake May, though the J.J. McCarthy at number two overall rumors have started to surface at the owners' meetings. Number three, the New England Patriots, which is another uh, pivot point of the draft. Jane Daniels, quarterback LSU, who we talked a lot about last week. Okay, let's 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 stop there. Let's stop there. With these top three guys, we got uh, Williams, May, Daniels. That's exactly how I would approach it. Chuck, how are you feeling so far? Yeah, if it, if it went that way, um, uh, yeah, I'd definitely buy that. Um, you know, I, I again, just to reiterate what I said earlier, uh, I think it's quarterback, quarterback, quarterback to start the draft, and then I wouldn't be surprised if it's not quarterback, 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 so if it's not four of them uh, coming right out of the chute. So uh, my expectation, you know, no, no matter how what the preferences are, that's what we're not privy to, uh, but the quarterback need meeting the quarterback value uh, it seems uh, it seems apparent to me that the first three coming off the board in whatever order um, is is you know preferred by the two the three draft drafters. Uh, I think that that makes a lot of sense to me. God, four quarterbacks to start the draft is insane to me. I know yeah. that a lot of teams are desperate, but the NFL is down bad at that <laughs> point. Uh, the first the first <laughs> trade that comes in is the Vikings jumping up to number four, swapping with the Cardinals and taking the aforementioned J.J. McCarthy out of Michigan. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on this for the Vikings? Well, for the Vikings, I think this is I think this is a reach. But you're also going. I mean, you're in full recruitment mode for one of the best players your franchise has ever had in Justin Jefferson. And if you feel like you can sell Justin Jefferson on J.J. McCarthy, maybe you draw up a J.J. to J.J. marketing scheme and all that stuff. Maybe. I just don't see it, man. I don't see the third level, the second and third level throws. Say what you want about Kirk yeah. Cousins, his primetime record, his playoff record, whatever. That motherfucker can make the throws down the field. <laughs> he is an elite tight window thrower, which is where a player like Justin Jefferson really uh, succeeds. I just don't see it from J.J. McCarthy, and I'm not saying he can't do it. I'm just saying I don't think he does do it right now. And if it's a rough rookie season... And it's not like that team is loaded with talent outside of their playmakers. It's going to be a hard sell to Jefferson moving forward. For the Cardinals, I think this is like the best thing ever. You haven't seen it because it hasn't really been shown. Um, but, you know, based off of the combine, based off of the pro day, and this is kind of why they do these things, uh, it, you know, it looks like he does have the talent and the arm strength to make those throws he just never was asked to do it now you also have to keep in mind he played on a national championship team um mm -hmm. there are a lot of good things to go with that but in terms of trying to project the future i mean he's not every game that he played he had the best offensive line 
<laughs> in that game. He had the best yes. defense in that game. He probably yes. had the best skill players uh, with him in that game. Um, and so it won't be a situation where he can just manage at the National Football League. He is going to have to uh, rise his game up. But um, the theory being that he's more than capable and with – three years younger than nearly everybody else on this board at his position with the exception of Drake May and Caleb Williams, uh, that, you know, you have we, – we really don't have any idea. He's just scratching the surface on the kind of quarterback that he's going to be. I don't see it. I mean, I put him sixth last week when we ranked him because I don't I see it. it. But uh, obviously there's, there's a buzz around him, and it was happening long before we got to the combine. Um, people were wondering if he is a top three. Repick Adam Schefter and other insiders were sort of suggesting that he could be end up being a top three pick. So, is the Minnesota interest is that the smoke? Is that the, sh the that is being thrown out there? Do they really want Drake May Jackson, uh, your guy? Uh, have they gone on this big campaign of not denying their interest in JJ McCarthy so that the Commanders will <laughs> will take him and then all of a sudden May drops to four or five? so that the Vikings can come I mean, up that's from 11 dream. and grab him. That's the dream scenario for the Vikings. But in this mock, man, they made the move for for JJ, and there's no way they don't do that without 11 plus 23 plus, honestly, probably 25 first. And I would not do that based on projection on this quarterback. The stickiest yeah. stats in college football for success in the NFL is production at the college level. And look, I watched a fair amount of Michigan football. No question, they had the most talented roster in in all of Division One. And I'm not the type. Listeners of, of Cigar Thoughts know this. I'm not the type to penalize good players for playing with other good players. I've also seen what Michigan has done when they've played the best teams in on their schedule, and when they play Ohio State, when they play Penn State, when they played Alabama, when they played University of Washington. They took the ball out of J.J. McCarthy's hands. So the projection is huge. Like, yes, he had great teammates. His coach, who is supposedly calling him, you know, the best quarterback ever, is taking the ball out of his quarterback's hands. All right, the next trade, the Jets jump up to number five. Win now Woo! move for Aaron Rodgers. Uh, they take Marvin Harrison Jr. out of Ohio State. Then at number six, the New York Giants take Malik Neighbors, wide receiver out of LSU, which leaves Roma Dunze uh, moving further down the board. And then at seven, we have our first offensive lineman with Joe Alt, tackle out of Notre Dame. Let's let's stop there for a second. So now we're now we're seeing the wide receivers, and you know, for a long time there was a talk. I mean, I'm talking months ago. Marvin Harrison could be the first overall pick in this draft. And he slowly kind of slipped back. We are talking about one of the, maybe the most highly touted wide receiver since Julio Jones, certainly since uh, Jamar Chase. And for the Jets to move up and get him, I mean, they better hope Aaron Rodgers makes it through the next season or two <laughs> because they are going all in on surrounding him with weapons. The thought of Marvin Harrison and Garrett Wilson on the same team with Brees Hall and Aaron Rodgers calling shots, I think that this pick would make them a Super Bowl contender immediately, and the Giants have to be thrilled with Malik Neighbors, which, to Chuck's earlier point, a lot of people are putting in on par or maybe even slightly ahead of Malik Neighbor or uh, Marvin Harrison, and I love Malik Neighbors. Like that's that's big moves for the New York teams. Mm -hmm. And then we were talking about offensive players earlier. I think Joe Alt is the best of the bunch, and the Titans in this mock draft clearly agree. Could you imagine being a franchise quarterback, vice president of America, and having Marvin Harrison on your team? <laughs> Oh man, I mean, uh, it, it it makes me cringe how loud his megaphone would be at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how good is life going at that point, where you're just studying film in the Oval Office? Uh, a couple of other picks in this <laughs> last little grouping here. I think if you're the Giants, you absolutely have to be thrilled. Malik Neighbors is wide receiver one in most classes in the last twenty years, and. You just haven't found that guy there. So whether you're going to try and push forward and try and resuscitate Daniel Jones' career 
or set something up for the next quarterback, whether it's someone they take in this draft, they trade for free agency next year or draft somebody next year to walk into a Malik neighbors uh, has got to be a very attractive situation. And then the Titans, when you have a young quarterback, the best thing that you can do is to put the best possible ecosystem around that guy, because that's going to tell you if he's good. Everyone is down on Bryce young and Bryce young might not have it. Nobody is succeeding in the ecosystem that Bryce young was in last year, terrible offensive line, no running game and receivers that can't separate. And, You know, of course, he's small on top of that, but like he didn't have a chance. I'm not sure that Joe Burrow would have a chance in that in that situation. So kudos to the Titans for going out and getting the best offensive tackle in this draft for spending, I think, way too much for Calvin Ridley for, you know, trading for DeAndre Hopkins last year. Like, let's find out if Will Levis is that guy. Well, every one of these teams, now we're in this range of every one of these teams that's going to have to make the decision, what is the what is the thing that will help a quarterback succeed more? Is it the weapon uh, in the passing game, the downfield aerial attack? Is it the Jamar Chase or is it the protection um, for the offense? And so that's those are the decisions that are going to start being made, whether Arizona trades down from four, to put themselves in a position to add more draft capital and just more, you know, just fill more holes uh, on their team, or do they take advantage of the opportunity uh, to grab that number one receiver that every quarterback wants? So all of these teams are going to be making uh, one of those three decisions. Uh, Is it time to get a, a wide receiver one? Is it time to get more protection for my quarterback? Uh, Or do I move down, uh, you know, add draft capital for a team that wants to come up and get a quarterback? So we're in that we're in that range four through seven. Every single one of those teams are going to be discussing those three possibilities. All right. At number eight, the Atlanta Falcons take Dallas Turner, edge defender out of Alabama. Number nine. First defensive player off the board, and I think the best defensive player in this draft. Okay. Number nine, the Bears take Romo Dunze, ending his uh, free fall (laughs) to pair with Caleb Williams. And then uh, at 10, after the Chargers trade down, they select Tali Fuanga, uh, offensive tackle out of Oregon State. So that's our second O-lineman to close out the lottery. Okay. All right. So there's your top 10. So first of all, love Dallas Turner for the Falcons. They have generated... The least amount of pressures in the NFL over the last three years. So much of the discourse around that team has been you've used three consecutive top 10 picks on these offensive playmakers and basically just punted on quarterback. They got Arthur Smith the hell out of town. You need some defense at some point. That's a very winnable division. You went all in on Kirk Cousins. You feel like your offense is set. I love, love, love this pick for them. And when's the last time you saw the first defensive player in a draft go number eight overall? I'd be willing to bet it's never happened before. But the pick that I love here, we were talking about the Titans earlier and building a successful sort of biodome around their young quarterback. How about what the Bears are doing? And if we're going to take this mock draft as reality for the sake of the show... How about what they're doing for Caleb Williams, taking him number one overall? They drafted a tackle last year. They brought, they traded for DJ Moore. They brought in Keenan Allen, and now you add Roma Dunze. And let me just talk because because Chuck, I'm I'm very curious to get your thoughts on Dunze. I want to point out one thing about him that I think is really remarkable. There is a gentleman on Twitter named Matt Harmon who uh, runs the website Reception Perception which I think is the single best grading system for wide receivers that exists. And he grades every single prospect on all nine routes. There are nine different routes that a wide receiver can run. In his history of doing this, there have been two receivers that have been considered. So you, they're graded as red, yellow, or green, right? Red, below average, yellow, average, green, above average. There have been two receivers that have graded as green in all nine routes. Devontae Adams and Roma Dunze. Mm. Yeah, tremendous ball skills. And that is through, that's not through the prism of bias because, you know, I loved watching him play for the Huskies. Um, just tremendous ball skills. And to think there was a time 
uh, prior to Kalen DeBoer where people wondered if he was even any good. Uh, and then all of a sudden you get him in, a, in the right system with the right quarterback and the, the right to development and then watch him showcase the size and the athleticism. But the thing that really stands out to me about Roma Dunze is uh, the skill. Uh, that he brings to the football mm. field, um, his ability to catch the ball, his ability to run routes, and uh, he just looks so he just looks so calm uh, out on the football field. So I love him. If he made it to number nine, I think that would be a steal does, for the man. Chicago Bears. And you're right. I mean, you suddenly went from this team has no offensive talent. And and it was a couple of years ago you were saying that about the Chicago Bears. Where's the offensive talent? To suddenly you have Caleb Williams, a That's quarterback, right. DeAndre Swift at running back, and then you've got a wide receiver trio of Adunze, Allen, and more, plus Cole Komet's a really good tight end. Yeah, man. I mean, I if I was a Bears fan and this is how this draft fell, and I'm leaving the top ten with Caleb Williams and, and Roma Dunze, I, I mean – <laughs> this is this is an unprecedented era of Chicago Bears offense ahead of us. All right, let's pick up the pace here a little bit. Mike, why don't you uh, read us the next five picks between number 10 and when the Seahawks are on the clock? Yep. All right. So the Cardinals slide down to 11 and take Jared Verse and edge out of Florida State. Love the, that. The Broncos at 12 take Brock Bowers, tight end out of Georgia. 13, the Las Vegas Raiders take Michael Penix Jr., Ooh. quarterback out of Washington. At 14, the Saints take Olu Fashanu, offensive tackle out of Penn this State. This is crazy. These are top 10 quality picks that are going right yeah. now. And then uh, pick 15, the Colts take Quinion Mitchell, cornerback out of Toledo. All right. What stands out to you about that stretch, Chuck? Well, Penix for sure, and I mean, you guys are too young to know this, but that's such a Raider pick. I mean, they were the team that pretty much, like, we just want to throw bombs all over the football field, and this is one of the most accurate deep throwers of all time. To me, it makes the most sense for the Raiders to who want to win right now, and they have stated how they want a champion. I mean, I know Michael Penix didn't win a national championship, but he had a pretty he good came run. damn close. Uh, yeah, uh, there with the uh, Washington Huskies. To me, it really makes kind of the most sense for the Raiders who want to win right away this year with whoever they take at quarterback. Um, and yet it will be excruciating, I would think, that night waiting for him to fall all the way to 13th if that's the guy that they've circled that they've wanted. But on paper, it just makes a lot of sense. They love to throw the ball deep. They've got Devontae Adams. Uh, and so why not get the most accurate thrower in the draft? And and like we talked about last week, I, I think you and I both agree on that fact. You know, there's some yeah. things working against Michael Penix Jr., the lack of mobility, the injury history, the age. But when it comes to spinning that football, putting it where it needs to be with small margins for error, when it needs to get there, I think that he is elite at that. And I think that because a lot of the discourse around Penix has surrounded him being a day two or a day three pick, look, that ain't happening. This dude is getting steamed up. Right. When those yeah, top four quarterbacks go off the board, the value of Michael Penix Jr. is going to scream to the top of the draft boards for any quarterback needy team. And honestly, I don't hate the pick for the Raiders, and I don't think it's the worst position ever for, for Penix to go into. No, and, and if you're the Raiders and you're sitting there and you know the Broncos need a quarterback too in your division, and if you really want Penix – are you going to wait for him at 13? I mean, I know Daniel Jeremiah can't make every every pick a trade in his mock draft, but can you imagine how excruciating that would be? You're oh, my there gosh. At 13, you when you see the first the four picks of the want. draft, first four yeah. picks of the draft for quarterbacks, you got to wait nine more picks. And you know Denver's in front of you and has a quarterback need, and you can't trust anything Sean Payton has released out there for public knowledge. I mean, I don't, I don't even think they would wait till 13. I think at that stage it would just be we if, if that's the guy that they would want, and we don't know if that's the guy they want, but they would, they'd would they have to move up too. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> maybe it's not six in the first 13. Maybe it's six in the first 12. Um, I, I think there's a chance that that could happen in this particular draft. That's just how important the quarterback position has become. That's right. And, and this latest run of picks puts the Seahawks on the clock. Mike, who does Daniel Jeremiah have them taking? 
with everybody that you guys uh, personally mocked the Seahawks last week still on the board at 16, the Seahawks select in this mock draft. Troy Fautanu out of Washington, uh-huh. offensive tackle who could project oh, a kick inside. Who could have predicted that? Yeah, wow. Who could have predicted insane. that? Absolutely oh, insane. That. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Bright well, minds. You already know I love the pick. I will say yeah. when, when Terrible I Terrible pick. Horrible. When, <laughs> when I said Fire last Schneider. week. Fire Schneider. When I said last week that this was my guy, it was because I assumed that Byron Murphy, the defensive tackle out of Texas, and the defensive end out of UCLA would be off the board. Both of those guys are still on the board in this mock draft, and I would probably take Latu here if he was still there. He, he Of all the guys that I think mm. is realistic could fall to Seattle at 16, he's my number one. Yeah. Uh, if that scenario unfolds and you already know I'm trading down, but to play the game, um, maybe it's Murphy out of Texas kind of with you at that stage. Yeah. Um, you know, that, you know, I I do, as I said before, I don't, I don't want to sound hypocritical. Um, you know, that I think that they're more in a mode of need, uh, than what they've been in the past. They've got some obvious needs to fill. They've got they two do. starters to find in this draft. Um, uh, so Fatana would make sense because that gets you get to plug in uh, your guard before you draft again late in the third round. Uh, but uh, if if I had to take a selection, just maybe just to play Deadville's advocate, uh, it really is an opportunity to get younger and fiercer on that defensive line. And I do love Murphy. He's oh my gosh, I like him so penetration much. Penetration ability that's out of this world. All right, all right, Mike. Why don't you take us home on the last half of this draft, and then when you're done, uh, Chuck and I will tell you who stood out to us. Sounds great. So at 17, the Jags take Terry and Arnold, cornerback out of Bama. 18, the Bengals take J.C. Latham, tackle out of Alabama. Great get. 19, the Rams take Layatu Latu, uh, edge out of UCLA by way of Washington. 20, the Steelers, Tyler Guyton, offensive tackle out of Oklahoma. 21, the Dolphins, Graham Barton out of Duke, the guard. Uh, Eagles at 22, Nate Wiggins, corner out of Clemson. Uh, 23, the Cardinals, uh, Brian Thomas Jr., out of LSU. Uh, they get that in They'll the trade uh, with the Vikings, who moved up to number four. Unbelievable. Uh, 24, the Cowboys take Jackson Powers Johnson, the center out of Oregon. Uh, 25, the Packers take Amarius Mims, the monster offensive tackle out of Georgia. Love him. 26, the Bucks take Darius Robinson and Edge out of Missouri. 27, the Cardinals take Byron Murphy. The defense okay, I'm, I'm going to stop you there. Can we can we talk about <laughs> the Cardinals' haul in this draft, trading yeah. out of number four? Like, yeah, you're giving up Marvin Harrison Jr., who you know everybody has mocked to them, but who are you leaving this draft with, man? I mean, you got a Brian Thomas Jr., you get Byron Murphy, who I love, you get Jared Verse, who is defensive end one for a lot of people in this draft, like. It's time to stop sleeping on the Cardinals if it goes this way. Well, that that would be a haul. Uh, I think all of the, I think, with the exception of maybe Verse, I think Thomas and Murphy are going higher than that. Um, but it just it illustrates like that. You know, I'm sure every Cardinal fan out there wants to draft Marvin Harrison Jr. You know, they can already picture the jersey. You know, they they it, it, fan bases no love question. skill guys. Um, but when you think about what you might be able to get by trading out of that spot, and if it fell that way, um, I mean, how could you not love that draft for the Arizona Cardinals? So then at 28, uh, you got Johnny Newton, a defensive tackle out of Illinois, who is a popular pick for Seahawks fans after a potential trade down. Uh, 29, the Lions take Kool-Aid McKinstry, corner out of Alabama, their second DB taken in the first round. 30th, the Baltimore Ravens, Cooper DeGene, corner out of Iowa. Uh, 31, the 49ers, Chop Robinson, an athletic edge out of Penn State. And then 32, to close out the first round, the Kansas City Chiefs take Adonai Mitchell, A.D. Mitchell, the wide receiver on Texas, who did not haul in the pass to win the Sugar Bowl. That sent the Huskies to the national championship. Sure didn't. (laughs) Sure didn't. 
I'm not. Na- I'm, I'm not Nate. I'm not Nate Mitchell guy. Here's the thing. I said earlier in the show, and I think it's. I think we were talking about quarterbacks at the time, but I don't think there's any position where this is more true. In fact, it is statistically viable. The absolute stickiest stat for predicting college success to NFL success for wide receivers is raw production. And Adonai Mitchell wasn't even close to being the best wide receiver on his own team. A bet on Adonai Mitchell is that you're betting you're getting DK Metcalf because there have been two wide receivers that have not produced from a pure volume standpoint at the college level in like the last 15 years that have gone on to have NFL success. And it's DK Metcalf and Terry McLaurin. And like, I get the siren song of Adonai Mitchell killer name, blue chip program, and a 9.91 RAS score at the combine, the relative athletic score. That means he's a top 1% athlete at the most athletic position in the NFL. There are going to be teams that fall in love with him. I just don't, I mean, Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes will make it easier on him, but uh, we thought the same thing for Mikko Hardman and, and Sky Moore. I would, if, if you want receiver there for the Chiefs, Take Mitchell's, take Mitchell's teammate, Xavier Worthy, who is Tank Dell with even more afterburners. I thought it was Lad McConkey is the one that they uh, are, are. I like him too, out of Georgia. To the, yeah, uh, to the Chiefs at this point. Uh, I like Mitch a little more than you. I mean, it, it's hard not to fall in love with that size athleticism combination. Um, uh, but uh, and, and anybody that goes to the Chiefs, people are going to drool about the possibilities of you know Mahomes and said wide receiver and what kind of a combination that they're going to make. Uh, but um, uh, but I, I think Chiefs fans, uh, Chief Nation, would celebrate if uh, Adonai Mitchell fell to them at thirty-two. Yeah, I think so. I think so. One last thought before we wrap up this mock draft. How do you feel about the 49ers taking Chop Robinson, a very decorated huh. edge rusher out of Penn State? Uh, I don't think we'd like it, would we? Um, <laughs> uh, he, no. He, I mean, he he's, showed he's out basically, at the Combine as well. Oh, big time showed out at the Combine. And like they just let Chase Young walk, who was a mm-hmm. number two overall pick that just doesn't seem to quite have it. Man. I'm thinking like, oh, yeah, you fuckers, you traded your third round pick (laughs) for Chase Young and then let him go. (laughs) If they get Chop Robinson on a rookie contract to take his spot and save a ton of money, I would not love that as a Seahawks fan. Thunder thighs Robinson. He's thick. Uh, uh, So Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, man. I mean, if that's the way it goes, I don't know if any Seahawks fan is going to like the uh, way the draft fell in the NFC West. Um, So... (laughs) Those sound, it sounds like all three division yeah, rivals brutal. got loaded. Yeah, through Daniel Jeremiah. Thanks a lot, Jeremiah. Jerk. Yeah, DJ. Jerk. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, listen, man. Very, very fun going through that mock draft with you. I think that's a, a really good exercise as we talk about the draft because, like I said earlier, it's it's very easy to talk about these things in the abstract. But when you start lining up the dominoes, then you get to say, okay, what would I really feel about these different picks being made? And uh, like I said, Daniel Jeremiah, he's someone that you can actually put some real stock into this. Oh, yeah, he's great. Uh, He's great. And he's also in the mode where, um, and it's worth pointing this out uh, because we are draft draft Knicks. Um, It's worth pointing out that these guys go from truly evaluating Daniel Jeremiah was once upon a time in a couple of different NFL front offices uh, truly evaluating the prospects and then all of a sudden at this stage in the process it, they start leaning on what they're hearing uh, so that's why they do the updated mocks and uh, that's why it changes sometimes dramatically because they have inside sources. So they, he and Kuiper and everybody else are now in the mode of um, taking what they believe and marrying it with what they're hearing. There's a literal thousand mock drafts we could have chose. There's a reason yeah. we did this one. This is something that we're going to be doing throughout the show leading up to the draft. But listen, y'all, that is going to do it for the second episode of Whitewater Drafting. Big thank you to Chuck. Big thank you to Mike. Appreciate y'all being here. 
This is the real deal, man. I'm I'm stoked to be doing this show. Uh, yeah, it's a blast. Uh, always is. Love talking draft. And, uh, yeah, happy Draftmas to everyone. Uh, Draftmas, by the way, starts uh, Monday the 1st. That's the first official day of the Draftmas season. So hopefully you have your houses decorated and you've uh, um, gone grocery shopping for all of your <laughs> snacks and uh, Draftmas-type uh, meals uh, that you'll need to prepare uh, from this point forward. So uh, enjoy. Enjoy the holiday. As always, you can find Mike, Chuck, and I on social media. I am on Twitter at at Jackson Bevins. That's J-A-C-S-O-N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Chuck is at Chuck Powell KJR. Mike is at Mike Barwin. And the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can catch full video episodes on our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts and find the rest of our socials at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. And listen to Chuck every weekday morning on KJR Sports Talk Radio 93.3 FM, starting at 10 a.m. This episode is brought to you by Balveni Premium Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. I've long been a huge fan of their lineup, and we're thrilled to have them on board as the sponsor of the show. If you're watching on YouTube, you've seen me enjoying a glass of their 14-year Caribbean cask, which was finished in rum casks to give it a really smooth vanilla note. It's an excellent bottle, and one of the best things about a great scotch is how well it plays with a good cigar. And speaking of, we do have our own special release of cigars that you can purchase at a terrific price as a listener of the show. Until recently, you've been able to order your own bundle of 10 for just $169, which is less than half of what this blend sells for in cigars on the open market. But, because of the success of the Cigar Thoughts release, we lowered the price to just $149, and we've decided to keep it there. That's right, only $149 for a bundle of 10. As many of you know, we partnered with one of the most prestigious cigar manufacturers in the world to release these official Cigar Thoughts cigars, which you can order directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link on the show page to get these easy-to-smoke stogies rolled with 13-year-aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf. Or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, and we'll send you the details directly. And the cigars come with a Bevita humidification pack and a Mylar storage bag to make sure they stay fresh whether you have a humidor or not. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article at fieldgoals.com. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of the show. We know you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making this happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. (laughs) 